Okay, good afternoon everybody. Thank you for coming along to uh, our talk. And we're here to talk about uh, from zero to a multilingual Next.js site powered by Next for Drupal and Drupal recipes with one command. Uh, my name is Josh and we have my colleague Mario here as well. And we're both here from Wonder. Uh, we are a um, agency with offices in three different countries, uh, Finland, Latvia and Estonia. And um, over a hundred of, um, of us work, work there and we've been a member of the Drupal community since we were founded around 13 years ago. And yeah, today basically I'm, um, we are here to talk about this project and feel free to, to kind of check it out while we're speaking to you as well if you like. Um, it's available on GitHub, the link is right there, and it's called Next Drupal Starter Kit, and it's an open source um, template for decoupled projects, so projects that use Next.js on the front end and Drupal as the CMS. Before we get into our project specifically, let's just rewind a little bit and talk about why we like Drupal. We're all here at DrupalCon, and what is it that makes it so special? Well, one of the things is that it's got a really kind of solid foundation, and it's a module system, and with that it delivers a lot of our clients' needs straight out of the box before we have to actually write any uh, lines of code. And what that means is that if you look at this graph here, Drupal kind of takes care of a lot of what we need to build for us out of the box, and so that we as, as developers and builders, we can spend you know, much, uh, much more time focusing on the actual features that our clients need rather than just kind of putting together the things that we might have to do um, for every, every project that doesn't use, use Drupal, all the kind of plumbing and, and, and that kind of thing, if you think back to the Drupalville um, analogy in Dries's note yesterday. And so we live in a world now where decoupled Drupal um, has been kind of touted as the future for a while. For some of us, it is still the future. For some of us, we're, we're already working with it. But it is still quite, quite tricky to work with at times, and we found that on our own projects at Wonder, where we have a number of uh, client projects, big and small, that are using the decoupled approach. Some of those challenges, for example, um, are with synchronizing between the back end and the front end of the website. There's multiple ways of dealing with that, but whichever way you choose, you're always gonna hit some kind of difficulties doing that, um, whether it's a multiple repositories and kind of keeping those in sync. Um, you know, obviously mon uh, um, uh, monorepos also have kind of positives and negatives and so on. Um, and also there's, there's so much choice in the ecosystem now that there isn't really any established way, any kind of one way of doing things um, that has positives of course, but it can also lead to a lot of kind of analysis at every point that you want to solve a problem. There's a million ways of doing it and no established way just yet. And this can all lead to uh, making it a little bit harder to switch between different projects and more difficult for developers to jump from one project to the other or to help out. Um, and that leads to fragmentation and different ways of doing, of doing things between different teams and different projects. And so this is the point that we're at now with uh, decoupled projects, at least this is what we've experienced, is that what's kind of being taken care um, for us is, is now smaller. You know, Drupal is doing less for us, or in a way it's kind of doing as much for us, but there's more that we then need to add on top of it to handle all, all of these decoupled um, situations and, and, and all the things that I've, that I've spoken about. And so now the developer is a little bit, you know, less only, only kind of build, building these features over here. And they're having to spend more time on the plumbing, on the, on the basic kind of infrastructure, just to get to the point where they can actually start working on the things our clients care about, which is, of course, the features that, that they actually want us to implement. And so next, uh, next Drupal Starter Kit is our um, our kind of solution to this, and it's about simpling the process of creating a decoupled project, and that allows the developer to then focus on featuring, uh, uh, on building the features that matter. Um, yeah, so 
as Josh was saying, we, we've had uh, quite many of these decoupled projects over, over the years. And uh, at some point, <laughs> so we are constantly looking for ways to, to improve them, right, for, for our procedures and so on. And so at some point we found this project, which we have liked very much, and we don't say it just because people from Chapter 3 are in the audience today. Uh, it's called, well, uh, you probably, you might have heard of it. Uh, it's called NestGS for Drupal, and it, has, uh, it is peer-headed by Chapter 3 and contributors. And we thought maybe uh, just to give you uh, an idea, we could go and pay them a short visit. Uh, so this is the website of the project, right? And um, it details quite nicely what is included. And uh, in short, uh, this project is the combination of uh, a Drupal module or a set of modules and NPM packages that together uh, allowed you to create this decoupled environment, right? Where uh, Drupal holds the content holds the, the users, and then uh, your users will interact actually with that Next.js uh, front end. Um, we will not go through uh, everything here, uh, but I just want to say that uh, there's quite a lot of documentation and guides. There's also quite a lot of available code on GitHub for different scenarios. So if you haven't checked it out, our suggestion is to uh, give it a look. So we started with this. And, um, right, so if you want to get, start, get started with this setup, then you have to follow some steps, right? Install Drupal, apply some patches, enable the modules that you, that you will need, uh, and then configure some entities, configure some content types, and um, then create, of course, uh, the front end. They, they have provided MPX create commands um, for that but uh, then you get something which is kind of bare bones, right? And then it's up to you to, to continue. Uh, then um, if you want to enable, for example, preview mode, which is of course very useful and a very required feature, uh, then there's some more steps. And also if you want to have on-demand revalidation, there's more things that you need to configure. All in all, uh, this is totally doable, right? But if you start thinking uh, of having projects and trying to, to have them uh, working in the same uh, way, we thought that, yeah, but maybe we could automate a little bit of this and also um, build on top of it. And so we go back to the presentation, if I manage. Yeah, uh, wrong direction. Yes, so now uh, we have, so this is our, where we started from, right? So we, th we thought, okay, we want to use this next Drupal, this very good open source project, and we want to have uh, an easy way, easier way of uh, working with it. So we added quite, uh, quite many bullet points on top. I will try to go quick here. So we added some sensible defaults and adding more and more um, uh, features that we always need in our, in our projects, right? So for example, multilingual uh, features a bit more like what you get with Drupal out of the box. Um, we, want to have, we wanted to have one uh, repository that would have both front-end and back-end in the same place. Um, we wanted to set it up for our hosting uh, system called Silta, which is also open source. And um, yeah, we wanted to automate away all that uh, configuration. And for that, we found Drupal Recipes, which is also a very interesting um, initiative for Drupal, uh, Drupal Core. And then also we wanted to have a bit more out of the box, right? So some default content types that we normally have, right? So page, front end, uh, front page, article. Um, we like to use paragraphs in our projects. So have some example paragraph types for the most common things. Um, media items, images, videos, uh, file, the translation of the content and then the interface. Uh, we also have, um, we always use Elasticsearch for the search part sometimes also as the engine for these decoupled uh, solutions. So we wanted to have that as well. Uh, some you know, simple uh, support for web forms. Also, we wanted to demonstrate that you can use user registration and login, which is not so straightforward in this decoupled setup. And also we wanted to give some nice example content so that when you, when you s spin this up, you don't start from an empty page, but actually from a working, uh, working site. 
So yeah, time for time for demo. So yes, Josh, Josh. <laughs> I mean, what does it mean that it's not connected to the internet? Uh, I have no idea. Though. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, hey, it's loaded here already. All right. Oh, look at that. We have it. Cool. <laughs> Oof. Good. So uh, basically, this is hosted on uh, on GitHub, and you can go and get it. And what you what you see if you go there is well the code, right? So there's a folder for Drupal, for uh, directory uh, for for Next, and then all the needed configuration to have a working system. We also made an effort to have a decent uh, README file, not one of those where it says nothing. So, so yeah, here there's a detail of the features that you get and uh, the specification that you only have really one requirement, which is Lando. So there's various solutions to have local environments. We have standardized on Lando, so that's what we are using here. So basically, all you do is you check out this, uh, this project then follow the very clear getting started guide. Uh, all in all, basically you, run to, you need to run this one command, right? Setup.sh. And that will do um, quite a lot of things. So now, like in a cooking show, we have made the pie beforehand. Uh, initially we thought of running this live, but I guess it's good we didn't, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, basically in this terminal here, we have we have run uh, the, the command, if I find it there, right? And very quickly, we can go over uh, in broad strokes uh, with what happens. So first, the Lando uh, setup is uh, spin up. Um, if you, well, if you, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but basically Lando is a local, a bit like DDEV, um, is a, local setup based on Docker containers, right, in the shortest possible way. So here, all the environment is set up for you to host this whole thing, not just the Drupal part, but Elasticsearch and also the uh, front end, uh, the front end part. Cool, then more Lando, more Lando stuff. Lando is happy and it has worked, cool. Right, and then we install Drupal. So we install Drupal starting from the minimal installation profile, the one that doesn't have anything in it, not even the blocks and stuff. And then here, there's the uh, recipe uh, magic, which is something that is in, the, is in the process of being added to Drupal, ton, uh, to Drupal core. Uh, but you can apply a patch and use it uh, already. And we have set up these uh, recipes. And what you get out of this is all the backend configuration. Then we go, we go further down. Here our Elasticsearch system is set up. Here the Next.js frontend is built in production mode. And then many of you will recognize this migration runs, right? And at the end of all of this, you get two links, one to access the backend and one to access the, the frontend. So Let's go to the front end. Ah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, what? It's blocked. That's interesting. <laughs> oh no. Uh, it will. Yeah, it's here, here, but as soon as you click anything, it yeah. might not work again. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. Check the Wi-Fi situation. Yeah. This was the Faraday cage room, apparently. I'll try to connect to my hotspot, maybe. Yeah. Which may or may not work. Well, a bit of demo effect is, needs to be expected. <laughs> okay, might be working. Let's just Google some things. Yeah, it seems okay. All right. Do I dare to refresh? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, okay. All good. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So basically, after all that list of commands, right? So you started from having nothing and just checking out the project and running that one thing. Uh, this is what you get. So um, it's a kind of a small demo site with all the features that we discussed before. 
So you get uh, this front page that starts with a hero component, and the, the images are fetched randomly each time when you do the migration. So this time we got this nice courgette. Um, anyway, uh, or, or green beans, whatever. Um, right, so then you get some text, then you get a listing of the latest articles, right? We talked about the content types, and then something that teases a web form but says you're not logged in, then some more, uh, some more articles there, a link, some random faces, and a bunch of logos down there, because of course. Um, clicking there takes you to something that looks like a view. It is not really a view, but it looks like it, where you have the, these example uh, articles with one which is sticky uh, on top. Right. Then, uh, going over the, the, <laughs> the header, we have a search system, and if you search um, here in the front end, then uh, Drupal through Elasticsearch will give you search results. And you have a basic uh, faceted navigation system and also working search. So if we type Drupal there and we type it, actually it should work also if you type it wrong, but anyway, uh, right, so you get some results and then you can filter them down. We've seen it before, right? But this is not super straightforward to set up and here you get it. Um, with zero effort. Okay, then um, you have an account menu that we set up where you can log, log in and also we make uh, the migration. Uh, I am the slowest typer in the world. Um, okay, and so the migration will, will create a couple of users for you to try out. So Mr. Test User 1 now is logged in. And now we see that the web form is actually uh, showing up. So I put, wait, no, Josh, what's going on? <laughs> is this, this is not my laptop. Please do an A, that sign. Okay. <laughs> which, which language do you have? Anyway, um, you're telling me you don't have the Finnish keyboard layout, which is the best in the world? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> if I submit this, then I get, I see this um, success message, right? So now the web form has been submitted uh, to Drupal and it's saved there. Um, we also have added a, an example of a dashboard page where, uh, you know, in uh, Next.js, this is generate as your own private page. Um, and then here, as an example, you can see the beautiful web form submission that we just made. So yeah, this is uh, supported. And again, this is one of the features of uh, Next for Drupal. Then um, we have uh, worked on the language support. And basically, well, we have our languages that we normally work with. So we both work in Finland. And so, uh, well, Finland has two official languages, right? So Finnish and Swedish. So those normally need to be there. And also uh, English, which is good for us. And so um, basically here you can switch to a different language, right? And you will see the article translated badly by Google Translate into those two, uh, into the correct language, which seems like a silly thing, but it's, it's an example of those things that Drupal gives you, right? And you're used to that. But in the couple applications, it's very common that if you switch the language, then you just go to the front page for that language uh, because it's a bit tricky. And that's something that we, um, we have added to the front end setup. Then here behind the hamburger menu, if I manage, yes, uh, there's a hierarchical menu, which is also something that you always have to solve in these decoupled uh, projects, right? It's not super straightforward. And so there's uh, nested things and you can then uh, visit those pages. Pages are uh, built, again, random images, so hopefully nothing, nothing crazy. Um, it's a bit like Italy. But uh, yeah, so these, these pages are built with uh, components, right? So we have some text, we have a link, we have an image, we have a video, and then we also have a uh, accordion, which then has paragraphs inside it, which is another thing which is slightly tricky uh, that we thought of including. And um, yeah, I think that concludes the front-end demo, right? Mm -hmm. So let's have a very quick 
look at the backend. Okay. Right. So that's a Drush um, Uli, right? Uh, link. So we already logged in. So that's why it's uh, accessed. Doesn't matter. So now we are logged in as the user one here. And this must be very familiar, right? It's just the usual setup that you get out of Drupal, out of the box. We have a list of content here. Uh, we have our three content types. And if we go for the front page, for example, and then we have uh, translations. So some time of our life has gone into creating that multilingual uh, migration that runs in the beginning, but it works. So basically, if you select the front page for the site, uh, this is what you get. This is a feature of Next for Drupal. We didn't invent this. Uh, basically, the front-end site is running in a, in a high frame there, and you can see the uh, published version of your, of your front page, right? Then, if you click on Edit, you can then see the data that makes, makes the page, right? And um, there's some more stuff you can preview and publish things and so on. But let's not, yeah, we don't have too much time. Um, right? So that's one thing. Then uh, we saw that hierarchical menu, right? So there's nothing too magical about it. It is here. So it's done in the usual way, you know, parent and, and, and children and terms and so on. And it's also then translated. And that's how you get it. Then uh, last thing, we saw that we submitted the one web form and uh, the web form is here and our submission uh, is saved, is saved there. So basically this is the, the, the base of a possible project, right? You maybe don't need all of these things, but using uh, these recipes is quite a nice way and I really hope that this initiative gets to, the, to be committed because basically, if you think from a development point of view, what you have here is a working site that you can do uh, Drush CEX, right? So con uh, configuration export, and then commit it, and that can be the start of your project, right? So your configuration is yours, and then if you don't want the uh, article, then you delete it, or if you don't need something, you delete it, but um, you don't start from scratch, right? And that bar is uh, moving to the, in the direction of the uh, developer. So, yeah, Josh? All yours. Thank you. I'll just try to full screen this again. Yeah, okay, so now you've seen a little bit of the website um, about you know what, what the starter kit makes for you when you first run it. And now I can talk just briefly about the uh, kind of front-end setup, some of the decisions we made in terms of what packages are installed and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so one thing that this, uh, this Next.js setup has is something called incremental static regeneration. And so what that means basically is that although the entire site is, is built to HTML, when, you know, when the website uh, is built, that build only has to happen once where all of the data for all the different uh, pages is, is fetched and, and generated. Next time a content editor makes a change to a particular page or a particular piece of content, then um, only that one page or, or whichever page matches or, or uses that content is then built. So that means that um, pretty much when the content editor hits save, a few sort of hundred milliseconds later or so, that content is then live without having to wait for, for the whole build. Yeah, we also have preview mode for uh, unpublished content. So a developer or a, a, content, edi a content editor can um, preview that content before hitting save and, and putting it out there to the world. We also use TypeScript and a, a related package uh, called Zod on the, on the front end. And that ensures obviously type safety for our code in the case of TypeScript and then type safety uh, for the dynamic content that's coming in from JSON API uh, in the case of Zod as well. Yeah, and then a few more kind of opinionated um, decisions that we've made. We've got styling with Tailwind and interactivity with uh, Radix UI. So we found Tailwind to be a really good solution for styling our components across many projects. And um, 
yeah, Radix UI allows us to make uh, highly accessible components uh, quite, quite easily. Login for the front end is handled by Next Auth, and the search interface uh, uses Search UI, which is a kind of front end um, set of components built by Elasticsearch and, and designed for use with Elasticsearch on the back end. And then finally, we use React hook form. Um, we only have that very simple form example in the, in the starter kit itself. But of course, all of this is about taking decisions out of the hands of the developers and kind of making a default sensible decision, which we know will work for the developers. And if, like once, the, once that project has been spun up, if, if a particular project or a particular developer either doesn't need one of these features, or they want to use something else, that's perfectly fine. Um, the idea is make sensible decisions and kind of have sensible defaults so that there's a little bit more uh, consistency amongst our projects, but then between different projects, there's no kind of, um, you know, we're, we're not forcing anyone to use any particular packages. We just, we just think that it's better to have a default setup. And if you know what you're doing, you can change that if you wish. And then finally, we also have a storybook set up. So we have a reusable um, component library with a few basic components that, that are used for this, for this uh, you know, uh, basic starter kit with the idea being that, again, that's all set up for you. So that, that's all set up uh, for you already. So if you need to make another component, of course, you'll add it to storybook as well. And just to encourage that consistency rather than having some projects having it, some projects not, and, and all of those setups differing in slightly different ways. It's just so much easier to, to set it up once, and most projects then will tend to, to kind of go with that setup at least a lot of the time. And then we finally have um, Cypress set up for some testing as well. On to the back end. Yeah, thanks. Um, I realize I have spoiled basically everything in this slide, so <laughs> let's go very fast. So yeah, so as we said, um, the site is installed using a minimal profile, and then stuff is added on top using this uh, mechanism of the Drupal recipes, which as we said, is a bit experimental. But the good thing is that uh, once you have created that initial configuration, then you can decide, for example, to remove that, um, that patch completely, and then your site leaves uh, its own its own life. So this will uh, set up the admin UI and permissions for all the thing to work, right? And if you think about it, there's quite a lot going on. Uh, there's quite many required uh, modules that need to be activated. Uh, they are added through to the composer.json that you will find there and then activated by the, um, the, the, the recipes, right? Then, as we have seen, you have these different content types that contain various fields, uh, paragraph types. You've seen some uh, pictures there, videos, so the media types. And then uh, the language uh, setup is there. Uh, then also the whole Elasticsearch uh, setup. This is another thing that uh, there's a module called Elasticsearch Helper that um, Wunder has been uh, maintaining for quite a long time. And this, uh, this contains that um, uh, under, the, under the hood behind the scenes. So if you want to see how that is set up, uh, it's, uh, it's a good occasion. And then uh, also all the setup needed for uh, Next.js for Drupal, as we have seen, right? So enabling the module, creating a Next.js uh, site uh, entity, then associating that, uh, those uh, content types with the Next.js site, setting up the incremental static regeneration, uh, doing the whole simple OAuth setup creating consumer uh, and also do this, uh, yeah, so there's revalidation there at the end. And also uh, doing uh, this thing in Lando uh, where we host both the front end and the back end, uh, you don't need to mess with the dot .env files, which are always something that, you know, then the, you need to pass around with the developers and so on. Um, the whole environment, back end and front end is set up inside Lando and the back end knows where to find the front end and uh, uh, vice, vice versa. So, yeah. Last one. Yeah, so obviously this project is still in active development. Uh, we've used it for a couple of uh, client projects so far and it seems to be working well, but we're still adding things to it. Some of those things are 
uh, yeah, we'd like to run the tests in CI at the moment um, with our um, with our testing setup. It's it, it runs locally only, which isn't ideal. Um, we have some challenges running it in CI. We would like to solve those challenges. We'd like to improve the documentation uh, and also the hosting options. So right now it works with our um, in-house hosting infrastructure called Silter. You can also um, have a look at that because that is also open source. Um, but yeah, this, this whole starter kit is obviously first and foremost being designed for um, our own projects, but open sourced for, you know, with a view to, to let others use it. And 99% of this stuff in there you can already use freely, uh, but hosting is something that, that we haven't configured for anything outside of, of Silter, which is our own, yeah, our own hosting setup. Um, we'd like to improve the web form support. It's really basic at the moment. It's quite difficult to do it right, so we haven't tackled it yet. Um, so at the moment, you know, a lot of, like if any project needs web forms, they kind of have to um, implement it themselves. We would like to have some kind of more general purpose solution, but it's, it's obviously not an easy uh, task to solve. We'd also like a more modular setup. There's a lot of uh, kind of assumptions and, and things made in, in this um, starter kit. And we've tried to like only give you things that you're very likely to need. So almost all of our sites are multilingual, for example. Most of them tend to use these, these menus that have, that have nested structures and et cetera, et cetera. So we've, we've, we've kind of tried to make it work for, for most setups. But in the future, we, we imagine some kind of interactive CLI when you spin up the, the template. And then you can kind of choose for example, what content types you do or don't need and, and things like that. Uh, Drupal recipes is, is obviously heavily um, kind of used in this, in this starter kit. And we'd like to you know, keep up with that as things change and also use any other features that, that might prove useful when they do. And then as this is, is uh, used in more real world uh, client projects, we'd like to identify more things that that makes sense to, to bring back to the template so that more uh, projects can take advantage of it. Um, yeah, and then finally, just expand the user base, get suggestions, get feedback, and, and contributions. So hopefully that's where uh, some of you can come in today as well, or in, or in the near future. And talking of that, we have uh, a boff session tomorrow, and so uh, you're very welcome to come along um, at three o'clock tomorrow, and yeah, we can discuss kind of next steps for the project and, and, and maybe get, you know, kind of, kind of see what, what comes out of that in terms of discussions, maybe a little bit of hands-on if we want. Um, yeah, you're very welcome to come in and say hello. We'll also have some, uh, some swag from, from our company as well. So um, what have we got? Like things, bags caps, of things? Caps. Hats, yeah. caps, uh, bags. Yeah, so come along and, and uh, hopefully you'll want to talk about this project. If not, free stuff is always nice as well. And contribution opportunities are available all week. And that's the end. We've got about 10 minutes or so for questions and answers in a second. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, Tron, do we have any questions coming in on the app first? And if not, we'll take it to the floor after. Yes. Uh, first question, why should we choose this Next.js on top of Drupal? What are the advantages? And, um, because it adds this additional layer on top of, of Drupal, but why should we do it? Should I? I will do it. Let okay, me start. Okay, so yeah, so I just want to say, okay, this is the million dollar question, right? It's uh, uh, if you've seen the, 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 the Dries note yesterday. Um, I don't know, my personal feeling is that this is not a solution for everything, of course. Uh, the, the project needs to, needs to fit and it needs to make sense uh, with what you need to, what you are trying to, to build. Um, yeah, is that vague enough somehow? Or Josh, <laughs> what do you want to add? I mean, I'm, I'm biased because I'm a front-end developer mostly, so um, I'm, I'm very biased on this. Um, I don't know, like, Next.js has a lot of things that make the user experience like quite fast, um, quite, it, 
there's a lot of things that, that um, I think do result in better websites a lot of the time. Controversial to say at DrupalCon, perhaps, I don't know. Um, and also, like a lot of developers want to work with Next.js as well. And so whether or not you kind of think it's better or not, actually, sometimes it's easier to, to have people working on, on this side of things as well. Um, so that's a couple of reasons from my side. Yeah, answer is yeah. it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe a bit related. Uh, the next question is uh, how much faster is this compared to a normal setup? And at least the, the site that we're running currently in production, um, built for our client, is really fast. So, I mean, we have seen it live already. Trond has answered, so let's move on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Perfection. Um, next question Do you have an op? optional or an another recipe to install um, that does not come with the content or yeah so that we don't have to clean it up uh, yeah so basically if you peek under the hood of that mystical setup.sh you will see that it's a list of, of commands and the last one enables migrations and imports the content so if you leave that out nothing will be nothing will be important in terms of uh, entities right so menu menu items, uh, content users, and so on. So that's easy. OK. Uh, are roles and permissions followed on to the front end? So for example, search results, uh, can they be different for logged in or logged out users? Uh, so not in this startup kit. Um, this, this particular question, so if it's about the search, uh, this can be, can be added. Um, let's try not to be too long, but basically, so Elasticsearch is proxied by Drupal. The front end doesn't talk directly to Elasticsearch. If you know how it works, this would be a big issue. Um, so basically, Drupal is there, and when you do a query, uh, you, can, you can see, oh, is this somebody who's registered, and should I show these results uh, or not? And we have done it in other projects, but um, it's not such a, I don't know, at least so far, we thought this is not a very common requirement, we might rethink it then. Thank you. Um, next, uh, use Lando in this one. Uh, have, do we have plans to add DDEV as a local environment? Uh, so uh, for me, this is very, very interesting. I know that uh, DDEV is also very widely used and it's also, I think, in these contribution days. And uh, my plan is to sneak into the contribution <laughs> And, and, and try DDEV as well. So we have um, specialized on Lando, so of course, uh, for our company, it doesn't make to say, oh, we have, there's a new starter kit, you just need to change what you use. But I'm pretty sure it's possible to achieve, the, or I really hope it's possible to achieve the same thing with DDEV. And I don't, see, I don't see why not. And that would be an excellent contribution if somebody is passionate about DDEV and they want to try and make it work. That would be great. Thank you. So this uh, project is done with path-based translations. Um, is there support for domain-based translations? Uh, and do we have client projects where this is a requirement? No, thankfully. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, uh, I think it has happened in some projects. But at least this seems to be the most straightforward way. And um, it's one of those things that um, probably would be a good feature, but it's not in this, uh, in this starter, starter thing. Um, any specific reasons why opting for Next.js instead of React or Vue? Josh. OK. Um, yeah, so Next.js um, uses React. So, so it is using React. Um, and also Next.js for us has been the kind of default um, uh, solution for decoupled projects until now. Obviously, those, those projects have not had this kind of starter kit, and that led to the, uh, the sort of fragmentation of different projects that I was talking about at the beginning. And so, yeah, we, we kind of use Next.js by default uh, at our company for decoupled, and that's, that's why this was the, the sort of obvious choice for that. Thank you. Um, have you considered adding Next.js app director support? Yes, we have. <laughs> um, yeah, we would like to support this, this app directory. For those who don't know, it's the kind of, it, 
Uh, it, it uses React server components, which is a new thing. It's only available in the latest version of Next.js, uh, Next.js 13. It's on our radar. Uh, we haven't done anything to support it right now. Um, we don't, like, we, we're sort of happy with the performance of the sites that we make with this right now, but it is something that we definitely want to consider in the future and um, possibly work a little bit with chapter three as well, because, um, yeah, I, like that's obviously something that you want to add to Next Drupal, which this project uses, and yeah, we'd be we'd be happy to to add support for that in the future. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's really good to hear. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely check it out soon. Yeah. Yeah, well, please repeat it maybe uh, just shortly. Say, um, chapter, three, uh, chapter three did release, just before I walked in the door here, we released um, our first version of the app router upgrade to next Drupal, and it's uh, ready for user testing. So if you go into the Drupal Slack under next, you will see where it lives. It also lives in our GitHub repository. And um, if all goes well, we should have full app router support um, soon after it's been tested. So just wanted to let that know because it happened right before I came in the door. There's still one. Have you ever tried, and what is your opinion about partially decoupled solutions in Drupal project? Have we tried, Josh? Uh, yeah, so we happen to have been in, uh, in different projects where this approach has been uh, is in use. And I, I think, uh, again, it's a very vague answer, but I, I do completely personally. I, I think that that's a, also a valid approach. Uh, it all depends on the features that you need. Uh, and it's one more weapon, no, not weapon, one more tool that you can use um, to, to achieve your goals, right? So in our case, we have um, different websites where, for example, the search is done uh, using that um, Elastic UI as well. And that, uh, that whole thing is a Re React app that gets loaded when you go to the search page, for example. And in that case, we need it much more of that bar that Drupal gave us, uh, but still, we still wanted to build a good uh, search interface. So that was done in that uh, hybrid or progressive decoupled approach. And personally, I think it's totally fine. Um, use that, it's, it's great. Use whatever works for, for the project, right? This is one, uh, one of the ways that we do projects. Uh, we have a lot of just Drupal projects. We have quite many, but there's this hybrid approach and also quite, quite many decoupled ones, and now some that use this, uh, this specific way of doing decoupled sites. What is it? Okay. So uh, these were all the questions in the app. Um, for the extroverts, there's also a microphone if you, <laughs> if you feel like it. Uh, but so if you, if you have a question, please, would you mind walking there to that microphone? And round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, hi. Uh, first of all, great presentation and thank you for sharing your code. I've learned a lot and more so chapter three for sharing next Drupal and hiring Airshot. But uh, why did you let him go? So that's the next question. So, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's another million dollar question. Yeah. So I have like five questions, sorry. So, oh, wow. uh, I know that next Drupal, I mean, maybe it's for chapter three more or less, but you guys might also- 30 seconds left. Uh, okay, sure. okay. Uh, I know the caching works, uh, the caching revalidation by route, but uh, in most cases, you kind of need uh, by tag. So for instance, you have, a, let's say a news on front page and someone changes some, uh, add the new content, you want to revalidate that. And uh, this is somewhat of a blocker you know, just to, I, I know you can still revalidate by path, but you know, it's not performative at all. So any plans to support that? 
chapter uh, three, guys. <laughs> so, well, what, what I can say is that uh, we have some partial support for the feature, not for the cache tags, right? Yeah. Uh, so, for example, you've seen that the articles are, I don't know if you remember, but there's this one page with all the articles, right? Uh, and also on the front page, there's these listings with that. Yeah. So basically, in the article configuration for on-demand revalidation, uh, we also have added these paths. So, the, you know, but then, the, the, you know, how, how decoupled is it if you have to tell the backend where things are going to be used there? You know, it's the usual thing. But anyway, that approach works. If you, if you change an article, you have told the backend uh, in which pages in the front end is going to be displayed, and so all those pages will be revalidated. But that, yeah, it could be, of course, more sophisticated as a solution. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, hopefully, uh, you guys managed something, <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, the next issue that I had is the views and listing page. For instance, you know, like on slash news all uh, page that you want to list everything. Uh, when it's like a heavy editorial website, it constantly gets updated. You kind of have to constantly keep rebuilding. That's a next JS issue that uh, at the end of the day, it's a static site. You know, any solution for that? You know, I always thought, you know, uh, for the first page, I just fetch the data. You know, um, that's what I do, but uh, it doesn't seem like the yeah, most... Yeah, so do you mind if I say come to the both? Because this is a really... I feel, yes. Yeah, it's a bit of a long question, but... Okay, I'll, I can switch to the next yeah, one. Yeah, so the, the answer is, um, it, in, in the, at least in the starter kit, it is be that page that looks like a view, it's not a, really a view, um, and it uses this revalidation as well, and so it is very fast when it's there, and then it's revalidated in the, back, in the background, and so on, and also on the front page, uh, there's a listing of the latest articles, but it's a paragraph, so it's somehow inside the page, so it's done on the client side. So yeah, uh, again, it's not super straightforward. Yeah. But, uh, so next one is uh, for web form. Uh, I was thinking, do we really need to support it? I mean, it can be like uh, your own input, you know, you just render a React input and just hook it up and you just use it as a, a store of data. Uh, that's also one question I'll ask the next one so you can wrap it up. Uh, one of the hardest part for me as a, I'm a front end developer so I just like to do this stuff but it's hard to convince first the client to pay more and the second your boss says why are we doing it like that, you know? So we never came up with a solution just saying it's faster and they say optimize your Drupal and it's still fast. That doesn't work for us, you know, as a selling pitch. <laughs> yeah, I'll answer it just quickly because I know we've only got one or two minutes and I'll just go back to this slide in case you um, want to continue tomorrow as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like we found that decoupled projects do tend to improve the websites that we make, but the issue with them is that they do take a lot longer to set up. And that's kind of like why we made the project is, is to make that set up a lot faster, uh, to kind of do, you know, a, a lot of that plumbing and set up work for the user straight away, um, just to kind of solve the problem that you alluded to in a way. Um, yeah, I will leave it there because I know that we're about three or four minutes overtime already. Um, thank you so much. Come to the BOF tomorrow if you want to. Thank you. Um, and thank you. <laughs>